Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this packed seminar. It may be that not everybody who wants to attend is here yet, but there are going to be very many more people going to be able to squeeze into this room. There is such wide interest in this event, I think, um, sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm Meg Russell from the Constitution Unit, chairing this evening. Um, there's such wide interest in this this evening, I think, because we have a relatively new government um, elected with some fairly, it would appear, um, ambitious constitutional re reform plans, although some of those plans, we're not quite sure what they are yet. Um, the famous, um, and in some uh, circles, infamous or notorious, page 48 of the Conservative Party manifesto listed a number of things, I'm sure some of which will come up uh, this evening, not least um, a Constitution, Democracy and Rights Commission to look quite widely at questions of balance in our Constitution, but various other things such as uh, the planned repeal of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, changes to electoral uh, rules, etc, etc. Um, we don't yet know much of the detail on that, but we're here to speculate uh, with two very... I'm assuming there is detail. <laughs> <laughs> with two very well-informed um, observers... Um, two Conservative insiders, um, Andrew Dunlop, uh, Lord Dunlop, um, is a former uh, number 10 advisor to Margaret Thatcher, you don't look old enough, um, and, uh, and David Cameron. Um, he's been in the Lords since 2015, he's a former Minister for Scotland and Northern Ireland, and he is currently a member of the House of Lords Constitution Committee, which I think, like the Constitution Unit, is going to have its work cut out um, if all of this stuff on page 48 is going to come to pass. Um, Chris White um, works for Newington Communications. He is a former special advisor to two uh, lead Conservative leaders of the House, um, Andrew Lansley and William Haig, as well as a former special advisor to... Patrick McLaughlin, when he was Chief Whip in the House of Commons. Um, he appears regularly on the Times Red Box. And I had a little look to see how true that was to say that you appear regularly on the Times Red Box. And I came across this, which I thought was interesting. Um, that's one of the first images that came up. Yep. Which yes. Prime Minister is he talking about there, do you think? Do you remember? <laughs> no, I don't. Was it, was it last year? Was it Theresa May, I think? Or yeah, this is what? Theresa yeah. May. We've been yeah. talking about this stuff for quite a while. Yeah. You weren't actually um, complaining about Theresa May. You were complaining about um, a suggestion that had been made by some people yeah. Uh, yeah. that she might encourage the Queen to refuse royal assent um, right. if uh, a customs union deal was forced uh, on the government in the House of Commons. So. Uh, this was April last yeah. year, so these debates have been going on longer than, uh, longer than perhaps we sometimes remember. I need to get a better headshot as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here we are to talk about this stuff. Um, both of our speakers will uh, kick off with about 15 minutes of contribution. Um, I may then ask one or two questions if I feel there are some really obvious gaps, but then we will throw it open to you, the audience. Um, all of this is being filmed. If you, um, I'll ask you to identify yourself if you want to ask a question. If you want us to cut your question out of the video for you know, reasons of privacy or whatever, uh, let us know afterwards or pass your question to the person sitting next to you. Um, we're going to start with Andrew. Thank you so Meg, much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the Constitution uh, Unit for putting on this uh, seminar. And it's a delight for me to be here because I know the huge reputation that the Constitution Unit has, and Meg uh, has appeared before the Constitution Committee um, on many occasions, and uh, we're always grateful to have her. And I think um, there's been impeccable timing for this uh, seminar. We've obviously passed the 31st of January milestone, and we are formally no longer members of the EU. So I think it is um, timely to sort of think about and speculate uh, what, in constitutional terms, taking back control might actually uh, mean. And looking back to the autumn, uh, I think it's fair to say that for those of us who are constitutional uh, geeks, if I can put it that way, um, it's been an incredibly rich period. I mean, a period that sort of goes back to 2014, 
and the Scottish independence uh, referendum. And, uh, you know, an unprecedented period by any standards. And I think we've seen a sort of multiple ingredients at work, a, a deadlocked parliament, activist judiciary in some terms, fragile union, and raising questions about the acceptable parameters of political debate, and that has been called into question as well. And it's engaged some big uh, constitutional principles, parliamentary sovereignty, separation of powers, rule of law, freedom of speech and expression. And I think um, we will look back to autumn 2019 and uh, you know, we will ask ourselves the question, you know, was it a political or a constitutional crisis? And I have to say, I think it will become a staple uh, exam question akin to the origins of the First World War. And uh, lots of politics students in their A-level year will be asked to opine on this great uh, question. Uh, I suppose my top line answer to that would be, uh, it's a bit of both. Obviously, when you've got minority government, uh, you know, that raises uh, political difficulties. Um, but one of the questions that we need to consider is whether, for example, the operation of the Fixed Terms Parliament, Parliament Act, did that sort of facilitate early resolution uh, of the <coughs> impasse that we were in during that uh, period. But I suppose if we step back, um, things ultimately worked as they were supposed to. We had an election, and we've now got a government with a fresh mandate, and things today look very different um, from how they looked last autumn. And, um, as Meg has already mentioned, um, one of the surprise elements in the Conservative Manifesto um, was page 48, and the commitment in there to establish a Constitution, <coughs> Democracy and Rights uh, Commission. And I think one can only uh, think what an ambitious scope um, that was laid down in that manifesto. Looking at the relationship between the three branches, government, the executive, parliament and the judiciary, the royal prerogative, the role of the House of Lords, I'm feeling my collar at this moment, uh, the Human Rights Act, judicial review, these are huge um, questions spanning you know, a, a vast canvas. So what I would just briefly like to do is to try and address some key questions. What is driving this agenda? You know, can we expect incremental uh, or more radical reforms? And how will that be carried forward and what uh, timescale? So taking each of those in turn, what is the motivation? And the first proposition I want to make is that I think it would be wrong to see this simply as Brexit related. Um, some newspapers have written that this is about sort of settling uh, scores. Um, but I think we've got to place it in, in a slightly longer term uh, context. It is, of course, the case that Brexit has sharply uh, illustrated areas of strain. strain. Miller II, uh, look at the devolution context, uh, the whole um, panoply of intergovernmental relations, and the fact that um, both the Welsh and uh, Scottish Government have now um, withheld their legislative consent for uh, government legislation, the whole Good Friday Agreement, <coughs> um, House of Commons procedures, and the Fixed Term Parliament Act. <coughs> the context, as I see it, is that famously the UK has an unwritten uh, constitution with parliamentary <coughs> sovereignty at its heart with huge reliance on conventions, and our process for um, reform has tended to be uh, incremental. Um, but I think if we look at it in a broader context, the kind of Dicean view of parliamentary sovereignty has been constrained. Membership of the EU constrained it, the devolution statutes have constrained it, the Human Rights Act has constrained it. And a lot of press comment has been, you know, about the Supreme Court, is it acting as a quasi-constitutional uh, court? From my perspective, I think, therefore, you know, what the government <coughs> is, is, is doing is reflecting the fact that Brexit has put additional strain on the Constitution. Um, but it is also um, saying we need to look at, is the Constitution 
uh, operating as it was originally intended to operate. And my sort of evidence that I would bring to bear that you should see this in a longer term context is some of the issues that we're grappling with here are, are not new, one, new ones. Um, I was looking back at a speech Lord Newberger, who was the former president of the Supreme Court, a speech he made in 2014. And he was discussing the role of judges in human rights jurisprudence and pointing out um, the profound significant change that was made with Section 3 of the Human Rights Act uh, and how judges were being asked to construe uh, statutes uh, in the context of compatibility with the uh, European Convention of Human Rights. And you know, he saw that as a profound change, a change that was mandated by Parliament, of course, but a pr profound change nevertheless. You can see it in also some of the other uh, uh, sort of movements, if you like, that have been going on. The Project for Modern Democracy, and I'll come back to why that is significant. Um, you know, looking at how the challenge of global change, you know, what is that producing? Uh, and how can that be addressed through better policy and better government? Policy Exchange, a very influential think tank with the current government. You know, it is not a sort of recent uh, development in the last few months, but it's been going on for some time. They've been running their judicial power project. And we were talking earlier about Lord Sumption. You know, he was addressing some of these big questions in his, his Reith lecture. Uh, and just to, to sort of take one of his quotes, I'm skeptical about claims that our system of government can be improved by injecting a larger legal element into it. So addressing the question, you know, some people have been calling for, uh, you know, a written constitution. So these are issues that um, people have been grappling with. They haven't just come along in the last uh, few months. And why is that significant in terms of the government and what can we read into it? Well, the, the Prime Minister's principal advisor on these matters is, is Blair Gibbs. And it's interesting to trace, you know, his sort of origins, if you like, apart from uh, working with uh, Boris Johnson uh, when he was Mayor of London. Um, he was part of the project for modern democracy that I mentioned earlier, uh, and also was a former employee of Policy Exchange. So if you like, my first proposition is, yes, Brexit has, um, if you like, uh, intensified the attention to all of this, but I think we need to look at it in a slightly broader context. The second point I want to make is, you know, is this going to be a big bang approach or is it going to be incrementalism? And um, my sense, uh, and we can discuss it more in, in questions, is um, I, I think there will be an aversion to what I would call grand schemes. I think uh, it will be more targeted, it will be more uh, incre incremental. Uh, we're all familiar with um, Harold Wilson's, I think it was Harold Wilson, correct me if I'm wrong, um, quip about royal commissions. They take mi minutes and last uh, years. And I think um, there are lots of um, big schemes out there uh, in uh, response to the general election. Um, we have um, calls for a new act of union. Uh, we've had calls for the House of Lords to be turned into a Senate of the Nations and the Regions, brackets based in York. Uh, and uh, somebody, you know, uh, I think Daniel Hannan wrote a piece saying the answer to Scotland is to give Scotland full fiscal autonomy. So there are lots of big schemes uh, out there. But um, I, I tend to the conclusion of Sir Stephen Laws, who was the former first parliamentary Council to the government, uh, who wrote a, a, an interesting paper recently on the future of constitutional reform. Uh, and I don't want to burden you with lots of quotes, but I'm going to just quote from him. The government should resist invitations to undertake comprehensive constitutional reforms, but it should be willing to consider limited changes to address weaknesses in our constitutional arrangement, arrangements exposed by the process of UK withdrawal from the EU. So just to take um, a few examples, I mean, the union, that is something that uh, I've spent a lot of my 
professional career, working on that, how do we strengthen the, the, the union? Um, and a lot of people are very attracted um, to a new active union. But I think from what I have seen of that proposition, it suffers from two, um, I think, significant flaws that need to be addressed before one could consider going down that line. I don't think it has come up with a solution about England. England represents a huge part of the United Kingdom, 80%. And if you like, the Act of Union could be described as a sort of quasi-federal uh, solution. And I don't think there is a federal uh, arrangement anywhere where one component part is so predominant uh, in the overall scheme. And also, we cannot ignore the fact that we have a separatist government in Scotland. And <clears throat> the idea that you have a, a, a sort of process which, where each part of the United Kingdom decides what it wants to keep as a sort of devolved area, uh, and then sort of pool the rest in some sort of voluntary arrangement, um, I, I think myself that in the current context that is a recipe for greater instability, uh, not providing more uh, stability. So I think we are more likely to see, and um, I, I've been carrying out a review from, for, for the government, which I hope will be um, published um, in the not too distant future, uh, I think we're more likely to see how do we uh, make Whitehall more union uh, focused in the way it discharges um, policy. And also, how can we make the arrangements for intergovernmental relations more uh, robust? Because I think that has been the missing piece of devolution for one reason or another. We can perhaps explore that in greater detail when we come to questions. The House of Lords. I think, you know, House of Lords reform, the first question you've got to ask is, you know, what is any reform trying to achieve? My own view is that the House of Lords um, is very effective at its primary role, which is scrutiny and um, causing, where necessary, the House of Commons to think again. But I think everybody would um, accept that it is too, too large, I think now larger than the National People's Congress of China. Uh, and I, I also think um, it's worth saying uh, as the former First Minister of Scotland, Jack McConnell, who sits in the House of Lords, that is the, the system of attendance allowance, does that militate against those who come from the regions and nations of the United Kingdom? So again, I think there are specific things that need to be uh, addressed, but whether a sort of big bang approach um, is, is the right one, uh, I'm slightly sceptical of that. Um, fixed term Parliament Act, um, yes, repeal it, um, but you can't just repeal it. You need to put something uh, in its place because repeal just doesn't uh, restore the status quo ante. But I think it is worth noting that we're talking about a new commission, but the legislation, the FTPA, requires the government to hold a review of the FTPA between June and November, I'm looking at Clerk of the Constitution Committee, I think I'm right about that, which is on a, seems to be on a much faster time scale than more broad uh, uh, reform. And um, the Human Rights Act, I mean, we've moved from a position uh, in 2015 that was all about repeal and replace with a UK Bill of Rights to what is in the current manifesto, which is about up updating. And I think that reflects a whole series of complex uh, issues. One that I'm particularly sort of concerned about are what are the devolution implications of that, uh, and obviously the way uh, in which the European Convention of Human uh, Rights impinges on the UK government is different to the way it impinges, for example, on the Scottish government, and that is a, a big complicating factor. So um, finally, um, process and timescales. Um, I, I think it is entirely conceivable that we'll see a sort of two-speed process. 
where some early priorities um, to uh, need to be addressed, uh, and then some other issues that will be addressed on a slightly slower time scale. Uh, and I note that the government has said that the commission will be set up in, in the first year. It, it could well be established, it will be established, I'm sure, in the first year, but um, then there may be a, a slower burn, if you like, on, on the work of that uh, commission. Um, this is uh, a joint exercise in, in Whitehall terms between the MOJ and the Cabinet Office, uh, and I think um, the sense I have is we're very much, to put it politely, in the foothills uh, of getting this uh, up and running. The first order issue is obviously to debate what is the scope of, of this uh, new commission. Um, in terms of process, I think it is, if it is to be of value to the government, um, independence and credibility um, is going to be uh, of vital uh, importance. And that suggests to me that there does need to be a degree of pre-consultation <coughs> so that from the outset uh, this new body has a legitimacy. Um, so some final sort of reflections before handing over to Chris. Um, and this is a sort of personal comment. I think if taking back control is to mean anything at all, it should mean uh, a reassertion of the role of the UK Parliament. Um, I think, uh, and this is something I think Lord Assumption touches upon, upon um, we shouldn't drag judges into adjudicating what are essentially political or policy questions. And that isn't setting up politicians against the judges, because I think if you talk to a lot of the judges, the last thing they want to be um, happen to them is to be dragged into a political uh, space. So I think it is um, on, the onus is on Parliament, and this is something we've been looking at in, in the Constitution Committee, the onus is on Parliament to produce good law, uh, and good law starts with good and clear policy that can then instruct good and clear <coughs> uh, legislation. Um, and I think one of the consequences of the autumn was, you know, I don't think it is the role of Parliament to act in loco, if I can put it that way, the uh, executive. But nevertheless, I think a government with a strong majority should not fear parliamentary scrutiny. Um, you know, my first uh, tour of duty within government, and you mentioned working for Margaret Thatcher, um, 1987, I remember the run-up to that uh, time, John Biffin, who was then a cabinet minister, I think he was even sort of leader of the House, you know, warned of the dangers of large uh, majorities. Uh, and I think he then got sacked for his trouble <laughs> after the election. And, but I think the essence of what he was saying was good. You know, government needs to be kept on its toes, and if it is kept on its toes, it is likely to produce better policy and better laws, and that is not something that the executive should fear. And I suppose the ultimate um, testament to that, and everybody quotes it, is the Dangerous Dogs Act, um, which sort of took part in that sort of parliament uh, after the 1987 uh, election. So I'm sure there's lots we're going to talk about in questions, but I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Chris. That was terrific. Thank you so much. And. Um very comprehensive in such a short time, and I hope he's left you something to say. I hope so. <laughs> I think that there's... I knew the big picture. He's now going to get into the technical into the detail. detail. Thanks. <laughs> All the difficult questions go to him. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Andrew. I, I appreciate that one. Um, I think that might have been the hospital pass, but there we go. Um, I think, yeah, as Andrew said, I'm going to try and look a little bit more about the, the process and the detail. But first, I do want to look a little bit about the manifesto itself, because... Actually, if you go back and reread the infamous page 48, as I uh, did for the umpteenth time today, I thought how much uh, it was a product of its time. So if you, you look at the, the language that was used, I think it was one written at a time of frustration, and that was frustration with Parliament, frustration with the courts, and frustration with MPs. So, and I think you look at some of that language, so, and I'm, these are quotes, so failure of Parliament to deliver a Brexit, of, of MPs devoting themselves to thwarting the democratic decision of the British people in the 2016 referendum, of a destabilising and potentially extremely damaging rift between politicians and the people. Now all of these are kind of quite emotive choices of language, but um, 
whilst it was written in the context of Brexit, I do agree with Andrew that a lot of this has been bubbling away for some time. And actually, it, the government does have a point in some of the areas that it's, it's looking at. And if you go through some of the areas like judicial view, about devolution, about the functioning of the royal property, the balance <coughs> between the rights of the individual and, and national security, and just taking some of those in turns. I mean, Andrew's mentioned Lord Sumption. And I will as well, in the sense that in, on judicial review, he sort of says that judicial review isn't working as, in, as intended. Um, and I'll come on a little bit more to, about court setting policy as opposed to Parliament and to the legislature as well being involved in setting policy and what is an ideal situation. The functioning of the royal property, whatever you think about the, what happened uh, in the autumn of last year, the fact that the courts have now intervened and placed constraints on the royal prerogative and the functioning of it means that we do need to look at the way in which that works. Um, and again, I'll come on to that in a little bit more, more detail. Um, so looking a little bit about the practicalities, I think um, the first thing is that it's... I, I was quite surprised reading the, the manifesto in that it sets it up as a royal commission. I mean, we've had... Uh, something like 38 Royal Commissions since 1945, but only four since 1979. Um, and the most recent of which I think was on banking standards, which was, uh, which at the time uh, was a particularly unusual way of going about it. And we didn't start off with uh, the government's intention of trying to have a Royal Commission. It kind of morphed into it, thanks to Andrew Tari. But it ended up producing a, a, a sort of uh, a, a good report that had quite a significant impact on the banking sector. But the thing is that in the most part, Royal Commission has taken a considerable amount of time, and most of them, I think it's something like 21 of the 34 that, that actually produced reports since the Second World War, took at least two years to produce a report. Now that's a considerable amount of time, and, and I think the government will probably be looking to move more rapidly on that. If it does want to move more rapidly on that agenda, then I think the government needs to know exactly what it wants and I think at the moment it probably doesn't know what it wants. I don't know either way, this is just me um, speculating. And I think it, it brought to mind, uh, as I was jotting this down, the, the famous Yes Minister quote which I always uh, uh, love very much, it's a one of my favourite programmes, that the, there are two rules of government, Humphrey Appleby said, never look into anything you don't have to and never set up an inquiry unless you know in advance what its findings will be. Um, which I think were a particularly good adage for, for being involved uh, in government. Uh, and I will possibly admit to playing Yes Minister Bingo with my PPS when I was working in government. Uh, but that's another matter. Um, I think never look into anything, into anything you don't have to. I think in this case, the government wants to look into it. It has to. The, this, the functioning of the constitution is creaking in certain places, whilst overall I think it dealt quite well with, with the challenges that it faced uh, over the last year or so. But in terms of what it's trying to achieve, I'm not sure what the government actually knows yet what it does uh, want to um, achieve. And I think, therefore, there's a balance between does the government know the answers what it wants to, uh, to do through the Royal Commission, or do, is, this, is this a kind of fact-finding mission to seek answers? And I think there's a, it's, you, you can have one or the other, you can't have um, both. And if it is a, a seeking of a, of a sort of genuine set of answers, and I think the choice of the chair, the secretariat, the panel, the interviewer, interviewee, sorry, will all be uh, incredibly important, as will defining its remit. Because if you get into a situation, as Andrew pointed out, the vast scope of the British Constitution is, is massive. I mean, you, two years will be a short time mm. to look into to, to all of this area. Um, and if it's an imposed solution that comes off the back of some of the frustrations, I think, that happened last year, for example, placing restrictions on the Supreme Court, don't know whether it intends to do that or not, just speculating, then obviously that's likely to be seen to, as partisan and that has a significant amount of impact in the future as, uh, as to the, the longevity of some of the uh, proposed uh, solutions. And one of the things I always try to do, and, and I think Andrew and I, when we were working together on some things tried to do was, was always think about how the opposition feel about this thing because at some point, inevitably, you are going to be in opposition in the future. And once you start breaking or changing those rules, inevitably, then that comes back to, to, to bite you uh, in uncomfortable places, but let's move on. Um, so in terms of the areas it will definitely consider, I think there are huge areas of scope. So I'll, there's three I just particularly want to, to look at. One. The first one is, I think, the functioning of the royal property, and actually um, the, the horrible headshot of me on the Times Red box from a year ago, I think, is, 
instructive uh, in the sense that this debate about the, the Queen being involved in politics uh, has reached a point where I think there is deep uh, um, concern and a really uncomfortable position for the palace to be in, uh, particularly around uh, the prorogation debacle last year, but also um, around the choice of, of the Prime Minister. Uh, because you'll remember during the case of um, whether there was going to be a, a, a vote of no confidence, whether the, the Prime Minister would resign or not, and how he would be chosen, and whether you just let that 14-day period elapse and, and nothing would happen. It's, I mean, it seems a lifetime ago now, but there we go. Um, my view is that politics should be left to Parliament to resolve. That's <coughs> the whole point why we elect MPs. Um, but equally, the Fixed-Term Parliament's Act in a uh, my personal view is isn't fit for purpose, so it needs to be changed. I think there's a lot of issues around the inflexibility of it. And the government's committed to repeal the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, and as Andrew pointed out, um, if you replace it, the, the, the royal prerogative is not something that's elastic. Once you've codified it, once you uncodify it by repealing it, it doesn't just spring back into, into shape as to where it was before, but actually you have to then recodify it. Um, so what then are the constraints? So just by repealing the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and saying uh, that it doesn't automatically happen that the, the, the Prime Minister then suddenly has the powers to uh, call an election whenever he wants. Um, so that's um, uh, a real problem. And, and then how you go about doing it. So I think that's one of the big uh, questions that the, the Commission will have to do uh, and look at. Um, the ju judicial review, and, in, and in, in the words of the, the manifesto, ensuring it's not a, a, abused, I think... The extent of judicial review is, is quite burdensome, and certainly my experience of, sort of working inside Whitehall and working with civil servants is they are extremely cautious because of the nature of, of judicial review. And there are, uh, when I was on uh, Parliamentary Business, Business and Legislation Committee, which um, uh, the Leader of the House at the time chaired and was essentially responsible for making sure uh, all the bills before they came to, to Parliament and were introduced were, were ready, um, we always had to make sure that they had the equality assessments, the impact assessments, the parliamentary bill handling strategies and so on. And these, the, the, the quantity of paperwork for each bill, I mean the bill might be that much, the accompanying paperwork was kind of, you know, literally had lever art files. And then we were, we were given it sort of two days before or even sometimes a day before the meeting and expected to read over a thousand pages of paperwork, which was um, ludicrous. But, I mean, I think there's certainly a frustration from ministers from when I was there and from ones I still speak to that policy making in itself should be easier and we shouldn't be uh, constrained about that. So the, the question I, I think that needs to be posed, or at least perhaps I propose, is is it right that the courts through judicial review amend policy through, uh, or, or is it that right that Parliament and, and essentially the government, but, but limited by Parliament, set the policy? Um, I mean essentially, uh, and I think Lord Sumption has made this point in, in brief lectures and elsewhere, Judiciary is not accountable. MPs and the, uh, of government is accountable to legis the legislature. So that is ultimately where I think uh, it should uh, be. Um, in terms of the uh, sort of the relationship between the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, um, Andrew mentioned laws reform. Um, I was in a whip's office doing laws reform uh, in 2012 uh, in the coalition government, and every time it's mentioned it, it brings me out in a cold sweat just thinking about <coughs> the scars on your back. I have many scars on my back that come from that period. But I mean, I think the, um, so the, the current problems with the Lords are essentially, I think, about its size. And I think under the current uh, system, we've got some, something like 800 members now, of which probably just over 400. Uh, are sort of turn out and vote, and the ambition is to get down to sort of 400, 450 uh, under the retirements uh, system that has been introduced. But that's going to take 15 years to get there, and, and I think that's not sustainable. So, you know, how do you go about doing it? Well, this latest suggestion has been around uh, trying to possibly move uh, the House of Lords to, to York. I mean, I don't know how realistic that is. I mean, there's a huge range of practical implications, not least around how you do state opening when they're over 100 miles apart. <laughs> um, I mean, also things like, I mean, if you have government ministers in the Lords, and, and Andrew will, re will remember this, you have to be in the Lords, but then you also have to be in your department. And um, are we now setting up outposts uh, in, in the north of England? I, I mean, I have nothing against any of these, and all of these sort of problems are, 
are not insurmountable, but there's also implications for the civil service, for the bill teams that work in departments, uh, for joint committees, for laws committees. Uh, I've heard it mentioned that it will be about saving costs. I mean, Parliament is still a World Heritage Site, and we have restoration and renewal, which we still have to deliver. So it's, you can't just leave it to gently decay by the, the River Thames. Um, so it won't save costs. So there's a number of issues there around laws reform. I mean, personally speaking, I think there are ways in which you can reduce the, or you can accelerate the reducing the size of the laws without uh, affecting its scrutiny function, which I think it does uh, a pretty good job about doing. Um, so Andrew, you're safe in the job from my perspective for a bit longer. Um, the, um, the role of um, the judiciary, um, it's interesting, I was talking to a few um, colleagues of mine who are more uh, involved in the sort of legal space, and I think you can look at this either way. You can either say that essentially that the, the courts did the right thing, I mean it, it, essentially they uh, looked at the, the length of time that the, on the prorogation case and said that 35 days is too long. It's my personal view that 35 days are too long. You don't need to prorogue for that length of time. <coughs> or you can say that essentially the judges ended up interposing themselves between Parliament and government. Um, and that's not the right way of, of going about um, doing things. And I think maybe the courts ended up with the right solution, but by the wrong means. And I think the interesting point for me was that actually there was a mechanism, or there is a mechanism still in the fixed-term parliaments for holding a vote of no confidence. It's just that the leader of the opposition decided not to use it, which I thought was a very strange thing that during the whole of that period that, that it wasn't um, used. But with obviously with repealing the fixed-term parliaments act, that's, that's going to go. Um, so what will it do? I mean, well, there, there's been talk about looking at judicial appointments and, and potentially moving to a system where you select these committees might approve or there might be some form of approval system but if you go down that route we have at the moment an independent judiciary and this risks politicising the judiciary. You only have to look at the fights that happen every time there is a, a vacancy on the Supreme Court in America to see uh, the, 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 the sort of well, the, the, the politicising of the, of the system. I think that would be uh, a mistake. I think the, the final thing I want to say on, on sort of the topics is around Parliament itself. I think Andrew alluded to some of this. I think there's, there's a significant amount that can be done in terms of reform of Parliament itself and its procedures that can actually lead to some of the uh, uh, ambitions that perhaps the executive wants to do and will lead to, to better um, uh, answers than perhaps are being uh, sought at the moment. I mean, select committees themselves, we, Anybody who remembers the Mike Ashley uh, scenario where he refused to uh, appear and give evidence to the committee or tried to thwart the, the uh, committee when it was under, uh, undertaking an, an inquiry into Sports Direct will know that um, it's, uh, it's something that needs to be looked at. But the difficulty around parliamentary privilege, again, which is prerogative and codifying that, is extremely uh, difficult. Um, and it, I know it was looked at by the Privileges Committee, or the Joint Committee on Privilege, I should say, uh, in the 2010-15 Parliament and, and was thought to be too difficult. But again, I think it's something we probably need to, to revisit to, to embolden uh, select committees. And actually also responding to select committees in a timely manner. I mean, um, and, and summoning um, government ministers back to the committee to uh, answer to the government response. Because at the moment, you, the committee publishes its report, government has to respond nominally within three months, and, and it does, it writes a letter back to the committee and that's it. Um, other than the questions in the House. So I think it would be interesting to take that step, step further and see what else could be done. Um, uh, scrutiny of government in the Chamber. Uh, the last, I think there were, there was something like six or seven months between opposition days in the last uh, session of Parliament or something like that, mainly because the government was so concerned of having lost its majority and sacked a number of its MPs that uh, the call for papers under... Uh, uh, different procedures would, would embarrass them and, uh, and <coughs> indeed that ended up happening. But I think it's, it's only right that you should have opposition days on a regular basis so that scrutiny of the executive happens. Um, and also the civil service itself, I think um, something that deeply frustrated me was around bill teams. Um, they are set up uh, on an ad hoc basis, there's no standing bill teams, but uh, they, they are pulled from civil servants who might have been in the department for three or six months. They have no experience of how Parliament works, their knowledge and understanding in large part 
of uh, Parliament is woeful, um, with honourable exceptions who've, who've been there a long time. And it was constant battle to get them to understand why a parliamentary handling strategy was there, how realistic it was, and, and what should be done. And also, finally, about uh, clearer drafting. You know, with a lot of the problems around uh, interpretation of statute is around the fact that uh, drafting is poor, it's imprecise, there's lack of clarity from ministers and indeed special advisors, I should say, uh, as to the intention of what's being done. Sometimes uh, clauses are dropped in at extremely short notice to deal with the political problem without thinking about the long-term issue. And I think that's, that scrutiny is a real issue for how Parliament works, and there should be not something that I think the government will ever go down, but trying to do a lot more pre-legislative scrutiny in, uh, and looking much more forward-looking from the perspective of, of the government. Um, finally, what's not included, I mean, uh, we, this is fairly obvious, but electoral reform, they're, they're not going to touch first past the post. Uh, voting age will stay at 18, not 16. And I think actually on, on the union, it was interesting that the union wasn't mentioned really on page 48, though it was mentioned in the Queen's speech in a sense of the government's clearly looking to go down and more of a kind of in turbocharging the uh, devolution to, to the regions in England a bit more. They talk a lot about shire devolution as opposed to just city devolution at the moment. And I think that's definitely got to be done. But it was noticeable on my way here this evening that I think it's something like only the first or second or third divisions on... Uh, English votes for English laws has happened, um, and uh, the SNP have done a stunt holding up speak here and see no evil uh, in the division lobby uh, because they're not allowed to vote on, on a, I think it was the NHS finances uh, bill, uh, which um, uh, applies only to England, and therefore being one of the architects of, of evil back in the day. Uh, was exactly the reason why we set this up, because why should Scottish MPs vote on something which doesn't apply to them? Um, though I wish we'd come up with a better name. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, in conclusion, I think the government needs to answer the exam question, what is this for? Uh, do they already know the answer, or is this uh, a, an attempt to genuinely source answers to the problems? Uh, the Commission needs a pretty clear remit, I think, uh, and timetable for reporting and a remit that is defined, that's not too broad, that can lead it going down a number of tangents and rabbit holes. Um, they need to make sure that that frustration about Brexit, which seeped into the manifesto, doesn't cloud judgment, and that this is done uh, in a, uh, as, as much a neutral or cross-party way as possible. And I think, finally, those solutions need to be long-lasting and fair. Yeah. The government spent a lot of time talking about fairness and about levelling up. And I think that really must apply to, to this process as well. Um, and I will finish there. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, there's two really <coughs> rich um, contributions. Um, I was thinking of um, coming in with my own questions, but maybe I'll insert some later on if other people don't get to them, because I'm keen to get to the audience. I do have... One thing is that as a politics teacher, there was one thing that you said that just slightly puzzled me, and this may be an unfair thing to say, but I just wonder if I could take you back to one thing you said. Which is, we have to ask ourselves, is the Constitution operating as it was originally intended to be <laughs> And my question was, originally when was well, that intended by who? Okay, I'm going to take the, the easy way out here and say that was imprecise language. <laughs> I mean, the whole beauty of our constitution, surely for conservatives in particular, is its evolutionary. Yes, no, 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 um, absolutely, and I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a threat of golden ageism that you know yeah. it was working perfectly at some time in the past, and if only we could get back to yeah. it. But was that the time when the monarch was in charge, or when the House of Lords was more powerful? No, than I the stand time? corrected. You <laughs> Poor uh, voice of language. <laughs> Okay, let me throw this out to the um, audience. Um, what we would normally do is take questions in rounds of three um, from people who indicate um, their name and any affiliation that they have, which is relevant. Um, so who'd like, to, who'd like to kick off? Okay, oh, we've got three. One at the back there. Yeah, one here and one there. Uh, my, my name is Jeremy Ross. And I noticed that our second speaker said that electoral reform is not a priority in the uh, Conservative government's uh, plans. 
Surely, if you're going to review the Constitution and make it legitimate, electoral reform has to be a cardinal element in it. I'm not saying one system is better than the other, but it must be properly reviewed, because at present it's absolutely unjust that a government can be elected with less than 50% of votes. Thank you very much. I think there's a general um, tone that should run through this of not shooting the messengers here, because these are not the people who wrote page 48, Absolutely. and they also don't run the Conservative Party. But I think that one of, if I had a question, it, it, which may come through, it was going to be about sort of where the currents are on this, who wants what, and so on. And I think what you're probably <coughs> doing is reflecting how you understand the mood yes. to be, rather than necessarily what you think is right. Although it is interesting, and I did mean to give this a plug, um, don't normally plug other people's events, but there was an event this lunchtime at the Institute for Government. Uh, some of you may have been there or watched, and actually the video is available. One of the speakers was the much-mentioned this evening, Jonathan Sumption. And one of the more surprising things, perhaps, that Jonathan Sumption said was that no constitutional review worthy of the name would leave off electoral reform, which I was a bit surprised by. He said many other interesting things, and I would recommend... Watching, uh, watching the video. Particularly, he was interesting, obviously, on judicial review, uh, and not necessarily saying the things that you would expect, given what had come from mm. the panel. He's a bit more sceptical um, than perhaps uh, you would expect from the from the Reith lectures. I'll take mm. another question. Thanks. I'm John Cartledge from the McDougall Trust. My question was going to be, what's wrong with the Fixed Term Parliament <laughs> Act? But I suppose that answers mm. itself. If only one of the three parliaments since it was enacted has run its full course, then clearly the Act is not <coughs> working. So if we can rephrase it, is what's wrong with fixed term parliaments? I come from the world of local government where you have fixed terms, and you just have to live with that fact and do the best you can with whatever outcome the election delivers. I think I'm right in saying that none of the devolved legislatures in this country can dissolve itself when mm. it chooses. Mm. Um, they, people choose and the parliamentarians that are elected have to make the best of the situation. Meg can no doubt quote figures globally as to what proportion of parliaments around the world Robert, are fixed you. term or not. Most of them. My perception is yeah. most of them are. Yeah. Um, and that seems to me to make a lot of sense. So it seems to me the onus is on those who think that it should be in the gift of um, parliaments, of governments of the day to decide when they surrender their mandates and seek a new one. And I haven't heard that case made. And again, both of you are completely at liberty to say that you rather like fixed-term parliaments because neither of you are ministers. But let's see what you say. And then the last man here. Keith Stratton, former member of Parliament and former member of the Scottish Parliament. Um, I think my question comes on the heading of events, dear boy, events, dear cliche. And that is that um, there are things that blow up, which is likely to throw a lot of this off course and derail it mm -hmm. and become very important to the government, not least this coming weekend, where we see Sinn Féin shooting up the polls in the Irish elections, suddenly having to be Irish television scrambling to get them into the mirror <coughs> of the debate, and the destabilizing effect that on, on the Irish situation, bringing a border poll possibly uh, forward. The other thing is, uh, probably principally, is Scotland with the three latest polls showing a 50 to 52 percent for independence. Sir John Curtis just said that basically he sees a, a fairly substantial increase since Brexit. The last poll was 47, particularly one the Salvation one. And then, of course, you've got the Scottish elections next year with the SNP running at 50 percent, the Tories are running in the honeymoon period at half that. Uh, and a, a, a complex situation actually developing in Wales, all these things. I think it's dangerous for Westminster, as always, to be contemplating its own navel and ignoring actually what's happening north of the border on the island of Ireland and west of Offa's Dyke. Mm, very good point, and a, an opportunity to plug for those who don't already know <coughs> one of our current projects, which is on the prospects for a border poll um, in Northern Ireland, in, in, on the island of Ireland. And, uh, and the great prescience of my colleague Alan Rennick for asking right. for funding for that uh, well ahead of the election. Uh, so do watch our website um, for that if you're interested. Would you like to go first, Chris, on the first round? Uh, thank you. Um, it's, uh, in terms of this, I will try and say that, I, as Meg said, these are, I'm trying to give you an interpretation of where the Conservative Party is as opposed to 
my thinking. I mean, both Andrew and I were involved in the past in, in uh, thinking with, without and setting policy, but without but speaking for him. I think you know our our views or our job was to sort of work for the party and work for the government as opposed to necessarily representing our own, own views. But <coughs> I mean, the reason I think why electoral reform is not a priority is I think the, the, the Conservative Party likes the constituency link. And if you have the constituency link, then it is either first past the post or I think AEB. And the country decisively rejected AEB in a referendum. Um, uh, okay, alternative member system. But it, uh, I think they like the simplicity of it and they like the, the, the fact that, uh, the, the, that it, it works. And I think it does work because you have just seen the Conservative Party win a bunch of seats. I mean, one of the big uh, criticisms of first past the post is that it, it had leads to safe seats. I mean, some of these seats that in 97 were racking up uh, 25,000 uh, majorities for Labour are now in Conservative hands. And I think that does uh, talk about the, the fluidity of the, the system. Um, on, so I, mean, I just don't think that the, 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 they will go there. And I think that the priority is more about making the current system fairer read into that what you will, and that's the language that they're using around equalising constituency boundaries, because at the moment you've got some seats, Labour seats, which are sort of 40,000, in, in 45,000 on the mainland of England, I'm discounting sort of the Isle of Wight and, and the Hebridean, uh, Alice, Alice Carmichael and uh, Orkney and Shetland, but essentially there are Conservative seats with 90, 100,000 uh, uh, electors, and, and it's, it's only right that you should have, in my view, a, a kind of equalising of that and making votes roughly the same when people live in different constituencies. Um, on the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, I think, I, as I recall looking back at it, there was a point where it was, I mean, it was only ever intended to be set up to last length, originally the length of the coalition government. And in recalling dis discussions behind the scenes, there was a talk about, well, then let's make it ongoing because this is a fine principle and, and so on. And I think that at the time, the Lords rejected it and inserted a sunset clause when they were go it was in consideration of the Lords. And I wish at the time we'd heeded that and, and just operated it for that five years and then we could have moved on because I think it would have solved a lot of the issues around the mechanics of how you change government when you are effectively in a, in a stasis situation where the... Not one party wants an election, the other one doesn't, and the government effectively just down talks. And that may be down to the fact that the government themselves decided to act in a in a way which they chose to act. I'm trying to choose my words carefully here, um, but ultimately that status was was there, and it was difficult to get out of it until the Labour Party decided to finally vote for uh, an election once the Liberal Democrats said, uh, and the SNP said that they wanted it. So, I mean, my personal view, I. We, it, the UK elections for general elections have worked perfectly well up until 2010 on, on with the Prime Minister choosing it. I think they will work perfectly well in the future, but how you go about choosing that system is very hard. Uh, I'm going to leave the, the Scotland to Andrew. I think that's a hospital pass. I can pass Scotland that. Scotland and Northern Ireland. Nobody's qualified to talk about The first thing I want to say is that my, I, I cut my teeth. The first um, sort of political thing I did was... I was working for the Conservative Party in Scotland at the time, and I um, was advising the then candidate in the Queen's Park by-election, one Jackson Carlow, who's now standing for the Scottish <laughs> Party. And I do remember um, Keith Raffin being part of what was then the by-election pack, press pack, that kind of used to descend and tear from limb to limb <laughs> the, the unwitting candidate who was standing in these by-elections. So it's very nice to see you here to, 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 tonight. Um, I mean, in terms of um, what you point out in Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right to sort of hi highlight that. Uh, and that is why I think the Prime Minister um, sort of declared himself to be the Minister for, for the Union, because I think he does recognise you know, how important and what a priority this needs to be for the government. Uh, I mean, if anything were to go wrong, uh, you know, and I worked for David Cameron and he was absolutely clear, you know, had we lost the 2014 uh, you know, ref referendum, um, you know, 
he would have been remembered for, you know, I think since King George, you know, losing the colonies, the colonies this would have you know, been the worst thing. He said so he's going to be, he said he's going to be remembered for... for a sort of correct. <laughs> and, and, I, and I do think, in, in relation to both Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, the government does recognise that it's just not sufficient to have the Union as, as a sort of priority in rhetorical terms. You need to actually uh, back that up with practical policy. How do you embed thinking about the union uh, as part of a sort of mainstream policy uh, consideration of, of, of the government? Um, I mean, in terms of the polls, uh, I think um, you know, in some, you know, we are at the point of, you know, we have left, uh, in a formal sense, the institutions of the EU, even though we're in a transition. Uh, arrangement, and um, you know, I think in some ways you could argue, you know, isn't shouldn't the SNP be doing better? Shouldn't they be up at sort of 60, 60 percent? I mean, that was the aspiration of, of Nicola Sturgeon, and I think it's quite interesting that her speech uh, this this week, um, you know, talking about sort of next steps, um, she was quite sort of cautious uh, about that, uh, and sort of realised that you know if if you are going to make the case. For a big constitutional change, um, you need to you know build build that case. In terms of Northern Ireland, um, uh, yes, I think it's you know very interesting to see what happens um, south of the border. I, I do think it is a huge development that the devolved institutions are back up and running uh, in Northern Ireland. And certainly, having visited Northern Ireland fairly recently and talked to lots of people there, um, I, I think what they are thinking about is um, the quality of their hospitals, the quality of their schools, uh, and, you know, we've had no executive sitting, and when it did sit, um, it uh, existed in sort of um, party silos of departments, and I think there is a huge appetite to see, you know, delivery on the ground uh, of, you know, what you might call the bread and butter um, policy issues that people care about. And I think one interesting development um, is this joint board that has been set up. So I think huge sensitivities to respecting the competence of the devolved institutions, but an understanding that the two governments, the Irish and the UK government, have a role to play in, in helping to make government uh, in Northern Ireland uh, more, more effective and deliver better outcomes for the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think you know, it would be interesting to see how, how that works. But I think you're absolutely right about the priority and that government uh, you know, needs to back up that rhetor rhetorical priority attaches to the union with practical policies to exemplify that. Thank you very much. Let's go back to questions. Now lots of hands shooting up. This is good. Um, OK, um, let's go this way. Um, starting with the man here, and then there, and then the woman at the back. Question, narrow question. Tell up, us who you are. Sorry, George Ferguson, former civil servant in the Irish Department. Um, a narrow question, picking up on the electoral reform point. I'm sure you're right that whatever the, the merits of the arguments, there's an appetite for electoral reform in the Commons in the next five years. Uh, at government level, very much. But picking up on the point you made about the um, devolution to, increased devolution to local government in England, I wonder whether electoral reform to local government is as close. It seems particularly potty uh, that you have first past the post, one or two votes per person, uh, and a massive number of one party, literally one party councils, but no other parties on, but the ruling party got around 50% of the vote. Coalition in local government doesn't seem to matter very much, people are used to it and don't mind it. Um, and the, the, if anyone looked at it, the argument for the status quo is particularly feeble. Yeah. And as a means of re-empowering local government, it might have some attractions. This is an optimistic approach. Uh, <laughs> here. Paul Tyler from the Lords. As Andrew knows, we are excessively suspicious in the Lords. And on all yes. sides, people have been saying it really is extraordinary that this is not to be, despite what Chris says, a royal commission, apparently. It's going to be just a commission, distinct 
for the Royal Commissioner's proposed for final purposes. And this plays into the suspicion that the government isn't looking for presenting questions, it's looking to presenting its own answers. And this is already, I think, indicated by the concerns that we expressed about electoral commission, uh, electoral form. It's ruling that out, despite the fact that in its manifesto, the Conservative Party said that equal value for equal votes was the cornerstone of our democracy. It doesn't apply. But I think the most interesting example of the way in which they're looking to present a particular answer, <coughs> rather than asking for people to look at questions, is on the issue of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. And I confess some guilt in helping to produce that. Because its <laughs> purpose was not, of course, as has been indicated, to cause chaos in the place. And it's going to be reviewed. It was to say, look, it's really ridiculous to say that the captain of one political team should pick the moment when their team appears to be winning to blow the whistle, the final whistle. And as has already been indicated, no other parliament seem to go on that. So it's not that parliament decides when it should cease. It is under the old scheme, the pre-fixed term parliament bill. It was the leader of one of the political parties that could pull the rug out of the parliament. I don't think it's logical to go back to that, but maybe with an 80 uh, majority in the House of Commons, we may be pushed in that direction, in which case I think the House of Lords might be even more suspicious. Um, I said I don't normally plug other people's events, and I have already plugged one event from this organisation, but maybe I should mention that I'm on a panel tomorrow morning at the Institute for Government <laughs> talking about the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. Um, and the rights and wrongs of its repeal. And I think this is an important point that we need to tease apart. Was it about fixed terms or was it about who decides and which bits of it exactly are wrong? And one of the things I did was look at the passage of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and, and just how criticised it was by your committee, Andrew, mm. who may not have been there at the time for the haste with which it was put I together. Um, <coughs> and, so um, we're looking again, aren't we? Le legislate at haste, repent at leisure. Um, yeah. We, you mentioned the, the Dangerous Dogs Act. It wasn't quite the Dangerous Dogs Act, was it? Um, but it, was, it wasn't very carefully thought through, and we need to avoid doing that again. Uh, one other thing I was going to say on the Fixed Term Parliaments Act is one of my... One of the mysteries to me is why the Labour Party had repeal in its manifesto, given that it had used the Act and also had it in its own manifesto in 2010. Um, so if anybody in the audience knows the answer to that question, do tell me later because I'm mystified. Would you like to start this? Shall I, shall I, shall I start? And, and picking up on Lord Tyler's um, point, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, he makes a very good point in the sense that um, I think we talked about it earlier. You know, there's a vast uh, sort of scope here um, in terms of the things you could look into. But then there is this sort of immediate issue of the Fixed Term Parliament Act uh, that, you know, I think in legislation needs to be looked at in, in very sort of quick, quick time this, this year. And uh, I mean, I think it does sort of, you know, there are a whole sort of series of questions. I mean, one of the reasons we can't. Um, just sort of repeal it, um, is that we actually need a provision that limits the, the length of a parliament. Um, but I think the other issue, and, and then there is the issue of, you know, um, who has the power to call a, a, an early election? Should that be mandated by parliament? If it is mandated by parliament, is it a simple majority? Is it a super majority? There are a whole series of questions around, around that. And I think the other issue with the Fixed Term Parliament Act is two things have, have, have sort of got sort of enmeshed with, the, with each other. Um, and that is the issue of sort of confidence. Um, there are specific um, terms set down in the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Uh, and yet, you know, the sort of conventions around confidence, you know, wh where do those sort of sit, sit now? So I think there are a whole series of uh, issues and um, the House of Lords Constitution Committee plug here, you know, we did look at it before and we're looking at it uh, 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 again and so hopefully we will uh, be able to inform uh, the debate at uh, the, the appropriate time. But I think you're right to say that that is a, an immediate issue that, that needs to be um, looked at. I mean, the one thing I, I would say though, um, 
although people talk about um, you know the, the, the sort of political advantage from being able to call a, an early election, um, you know some of us have been sort of discussing that, and you know people who have got much longer experience than than me, you know the occasions, you know broadly speaking, um, you know we have a, a five-year term. And the sort of norm became that you would have an election, you know, after four years, mm. uh, unless you know the government was struggling, and then you would struggle on if you were Jim Callaghan or John Major for, for, for five years. But I, I don't think I mean, my sense was, you know, even even Wilson in, in 1966, you know, two years after um, you know his initial uh, mm. election victory, were, was there great controversy about the fact that you know we had a an election out of sync with, with the cycle. <coughs> I, mean, I just leave that hanging in, in the air. Um, in terms of cabinet reshuffle, and then you're obviously taking the electoral reform stuff. Um, <laughs> I mean, the general point I would make, and, and Boris Johnson is said to favour that, is, I mean, you've only got to look at the pictures that are taken in recent years of the cabinet and people around the cabinet table. It has become in my way of thinking, absolutely ludicrous, where you have 30 plus people, you know, and you've got this new uh, con convention, almost, that people are not full cabinet ministers, but they attend cabinet. And I think that undermines the utility of cabinet. Uh, and, and I think if indeed he is going to do that, having a smaller number of people uh, round the table um, would be, you know, a very, a very good thing. You mentioned specifically the, the territorial offices. Um, perhaps I'm sort of revealing more than I should be revealing here, but I am not in favour of getting rid of territorial secretaries of state because I think if we're talking about the the, the, the union, I think whatever else happens, it is very important that you have somebody sitting in the cabinet who is able on reserve matters to represent the interests of the devolved nations uh, in cabinet and who is also able to sort of lead the charge uh, of representing the UK government in Scotland, Wales or, or, or Northern Ireland. Um, so I, I personally would not um, get rid of those territorial secretaries of state and I do not expect them to be sort of culled. I may be surprised by this, but I don't expect them to be culled uh, at the reshuffle. Okay. Um, sign of a good minister, he delegates well, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, if you want to redesign the cabinet as well, feel, feel free. Yes. I mean, if we keep it short, then hopefully yeah. we can get in one or two more questions before we wind up. Just very briefly, Lord Tyler, just returning to the, the fixed term Parliament Act, I think there's two things, or well, one main thing I think I want to say. The, the reason why it was set up was a political reason, fixed term parliaments act, and that was to bind the Conservative and Liberal Democrat parties together as much as possible. Um, so, I mean, the, as Andrew said, the, the functioning of, of elections under the fixed term parliaments act and being able to call a, an election whenever you wanted to, is, is that's how the electoral system has worked for the last sort of 100 years pre-2010. And so, the, I, my, in my view, the aberration was 2010 to 15, in the sense of maybe it was needed, maybe it wasn't, but actually it was a product of its time. And I think now we need to move on and, uh, and look at it. Uh, to, to be fair, that's the reason the Conservatives did it, I, I, I think. Yeah, but, but actually it was in the Liberal Democrat <coughs> and the Labour and the Labour manifestos, and I think it's been somewhat tainted by the way it was done. Possibly. Um, as, but, as previously But equally, discussed. I mean, you know, so the Conservative and Liberal Democrat parties agreed, a majority of Parliament passed the Act, yeah. um, and, uh, and now it may be that a majority of Parliament want to revert to something else, but they'll have to sort out the functioning of the prerogative, mm. which I'm not sure many people have kind of got their heads around yet, despite um, banging a few together. Um, on the conventions around confidence, I think actually that's the, the biggest part, the biggest problem actually, is around the functioning of the provisions in the Act where you have a vote of no confidence and a 14 day period is triggered. And then what happens? Because the whole point, talk, if you look at the evidence given by Mark Harper, who was the constitutional minister at the time, was that it was designed to be left up to politics to resolve that. 
But of course, in last year, and whether this would have been followed through or not, there was a lot of briefing going on from Number 10 saying, well, we just won't resign. And if that happened, well, we don't know. I mean, the Act wouldn't have been able to uh, accommodate that because it wasn't dreamt up, or at least it wasn't considered as a possibility. So I think whatever the, the, the way you go about repealing the Fixed Parliament Act, they, you would need, I think, to, to edit it even if you were going to keep it. So anyway, that's enough on that. On electoral reform, Andrew, you owe me a drink afterwards on this one. <laughs> um, uh, increased devolution to local government. I mean... Actually, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been canvassing and, and campaigning in local government in my neck of the woods in northwest London for a long time, and, and I can sort of see the point that you make around that, but I just don't think it's something that the government will even consider. Uh, I, I think they look at it, and, and, and local government and elections are just kind of something that will continue happening. But they're, what they're more interested in is the kind of the next tier up, which is the combining of, of local government together, like the Manchester Combined Authorities, the West Midlands, Tees Valley, um, trying to make sense of what the basket case of, of Yorkshire is, is um, going on in terms of, of devolution, um, and the pooling of powers together. So that's where the interest is going to be, um, and particularly looking at tri devolution. So at the moment, all of the devolution that's happening around city deals and, in, and the, the metro mayors and so on is, is around metro, they're around cities. And actually what we need to look at is how that functions uh, in the patchwork quilt around the rest of uh, the country. Because after George Osborne left, who was basically the main driving force, I, I think government probably looked at it and said, well, why are we setting up all of these areas, which are basically metro mayors and all these areas that are basically Labour? Now we're looking at it, and suddenly you've got Tees Valley, uh, obviously, where I think, I think Ben Houghton has a really good chance of holding on. I think Andy Street's got a good chance of staying in West Midlands. There are other areas where, actually, electorally, it might be advantageous. Now, you know, I'm not going to say one way or the other whether I think that's a good thing or not, but in terms of perhaps the government looking at that, that might be the way forward. We are, I think, coming to a natural end because uh, we're creeping towards quarter to eight. And <coughs> probably not going to fit in another round. But can I just ask you a political, the, the political question, which we've never really got to? You both, I think, particularly you, Chris emphasised, you know, what's it for? What's the big goal here? Putting, you know, <coughs> taking that as read a little bit, well, I'm not sure, not quite sure how it works. Basically, politically, who is it in your party who really wants this? And what is it they really want? <laughs> um, and who are the people who might try and stand in their way, aside from Paul Tyler and his colleagues, Where's, where's the resistance? What, what's the politics of this? I mean, we can turn the camera off at this point if you, if you want. Fine. Um, but that fascinates me as an outsider, and you've got the inside knowledge to give us a sense. I mean, in, in, in sort of preparing for this uh, sort of seminar, I mean, I, I, I did sort of ask, you know, that question because I knew it was sort of going to come up. <laughs> and, and there's always an assumption that there is, you know, one mastermind who, who is sort of driving all, all of this and and I think the reality is that there, there are a, a number of players who are all coming at it from a slightly sort of different a sort of approach um, I mean clearly you know, everybody's favorite bogeyman is Dominic Cummings um, he clearly has sort of views about this you know I've mentioned some of the other people uh, in, in, involved um, and so even before you know, this egg is sort of laid in, in public, I think there is quite a sort of, if I can put it that way, <laughs> I, think, I think there is quite a sort of debate going on in, in, in government to actually you know, answer that very question that you have posed. So you may think I'm sort of ducking your question slightly, but I think, I think it is because it is slightly more sort of complex and that there is a single mastermind who has, you know, I think Chris put it very well at the beginning, you know, that has this sort of end in, in, in mind. I think, you know, I mean, anybody who's worked in, in number 10, um, I think, you know, it, it has a sort of characteristics of a, a court in some ways, you know, with different voices who are trying to achieve different things. Uh, and I think that has yet to be fully sort of worked, worked through. Um, I mean, I think that is the reality. Would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think the other thing to bear in mind is the cast is going to change. We talked mm. a little bit about reshuffles mm. and, and bearing in mind that the 
departments may change, ministerial um, responsibilities will obviously change with that. You may also get um, uh, the levels at which ministers are. So at the moment we've got a constitutional affairs minister who I think is an under secretary of state. Well, we may end up having someone who, after the reshuffle, you know, I don't know what, what will happen to him, but it could be that that person then either changes or that it's a minister of state or even a secretary of state. Uh, will will come into that, and also the other thing to say is that you've got this. This is this thing we said is vast. I mean, it's an amorphous blob at the moment, as to and ill-defined as to where it's coming from. So, you know, there will people be departments coming at it from the justice perspective. There will mm. be people coming at it from con uh, the cabinet office, from the constitution uh, minister. Um, there will be MPs who have a particular interest in it who will feed into it. There will be number ten. There, there is no. Andrew's point is right, there is no single person who, who effectively holds pen on this. Um, and even in number 10 there will be different people from the Chiefs of Staff, the Deputy Chiefs of Staff, the, the um, uh, Constitutional Affairs per, uh, person in the Policy Unit, the Director of Legislative Affairs, all of whom will have a say. And it is designed, it will end up being designed by committee. And therefore the question will be, as you rightly say, well, where do they want to get to, what do they want to achieve? But, I mean, but I just don't think we can answer that yet because the facts are so limited as to what, I mean, whether it's commission or not, in response to what Lord Tyler was saying, the Royal Commission or not, or whether, um, uh, or where indeed they want to end up and whether this is genuinely a kind of consultative exercise or whether it is something that is simply designed to legitimise uh, the particular viewpoint of the democratically elected government. Um, and we do have to remember that the Conservative Party has won a majority and therefore if it wants to do something on these lines then it can put something before Parliament and it can vote on it and, and it will be scrutinised by both the Commons and the Lords. But ultimately in the system that we have with a majority of 87 and with a party that is largely, I think, um, full square behind the Prime Minister at the moment, I think if they come up with a, a solution that is... Um, that is respected by the parliamentary party, then I can probably see that that will, will go through the process and end up being the what what will happen. But as somebody I can't who said ever said events, uh, I was Robert um, uh, and oh Keith, sorry, and uh, that's that. I mean, we'll see events will have an impact as well. Mm. So it sounds like there sh there, there may be or at least there should be quite a lot more internal discussion. I think so. Before it sees the light of day. I think so. Um, I definitely <coughs> think so. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sure there are a lot of other questions out there. You've been a very attentive um, audience, and we could have kept going for a long time, but we never actually agreed the start point, and we normally run for just an hour and a quarter, so mm -hmm. we've kept you till 10 to 8, and that seems late enough. I don't think we'll start draining away. Um, I can reassure you that the Constitution Unit will be returning over the coming months to many of these points that have come up tonight on an individual basis. We're currently trying to organise an event on the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, for example. Um, but for those of you who haven't had enough, tune into the IFG web stream at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and you'll hear us talking about that. Um, for now, I think I would just like to thank enormously both of our speakers for their very thoughtful um, contributions uh, and I hope that you will join me in doing that in the usual way.